kingdom authority may be defined as the divinely delegated right and responsibility for believers to act on God's behalf in spiritually ruling over his creation under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Kingdom authority is the divinely delegated right and responsibility that has been bequeathed to believers to act on God's behalf to rule over his creation under the lordship of Jesus Christ. With God's kingdom comes authority. One of the ways that that authority is grasped, connected with and utilized is in kingdom prayer. Kingdom prayer is divinely authorized access for heaven to invade earth, for heavenly intervention into historical circumstances. And one of the expressions that talks about authority is binding and loosing. Now, if you've grown up in church, you've heard people talk about binding this and binding that. And what they're talking about is exercising authority. And that is precisely what the phrase means. But I wanna take you deeper into the meaning of the phrase, the utilization and understanding of how to apply the phrase so that you and I get the benefit of the phrase and start binding and loosing like we're supposed to. The word binding and loosing is not a magic formula for you to get God to do what you want. Yet it is a powerful formula because of what's stated. Because verse 18 says, whatever you bind, and it goes on to say, and whatever you loose. First of all, whatever. This scope of this statement is staggering. In other words, he doesn't give an exception. He says, whatever you bind, whatever you lose, it says heaven is going to back it up or to put it in contemporary words, God says, I got you. I got you. Please notice something in the phrase. You are the one doing the binding, not God. You are the one doing the loosing, not God. Whatever you bind and whatever you loose will have been done in heaven. So God will back up legitimate binding and legitimate loosing. To bind means to restrict, to bind means to lock, to buy means to restrain, to buy means to tie down, to buy means to hold something so that it cannot do what it wants to do. You are limiting its ability to function because you've tied it up, you've bound it, you've wrapped it up, you've put a knot on it, you've held it back. Conversely, loosing is to unlock, or to release, it is to permit, it is to free something up. The first thing that leads up to his statement in chapter 16 about binding and loosing is the statement is specifically given to and given about the church. I will build my church. He comes with binding and loosing after that statement. Why? Because binding and loosing is a specific authority given to the church. It's very important. Binding and loosing, the exercise of authority, is specifically given to the church. I will build my church. Now, the reason why that's important is you need to remember something about the church 
that we often lose sight of and some don't even know. Why you come to church for preaching and for singing and for fellowship and all of those are very important things. There is another purpose of the church that's absolutely critical and that is legislating from the spiritual realm. The job of the church is to legislate from up there to down here to bring heaven in the history. That is the job of the church. It is to spiritually legislate, not just sing, not just preach, but to bring the authority from eternity in the history. So it is, the church represents another realm, although it's located on earth. It represents heaven, but it's located in history. And it has been given homeland authority to operate in history from eternity. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is many Christians don't understand this. If you are disconnected from the church, you are disconnected from its legal authority in the spiritual realm. He says, and the gates of hell shall not overpower it. He says, so powerful is the church I'm building that hell can't stop it. He didn't say shall not overpower me. He said shall not overpower it because he's referring to the church that is legislating from heaven. So when you see hell defeating the church, it's because we're not building Jesus's church. We're building our church using Jesus's name. He says the church that I am building that legislates from history, Greek word ecclesia church was a legal term for legislation, legislating in the spiritual to bring it into history. He says, the gates of hell, gates is a legal term. In the Old Testament, it says, the elders met at the gate. That's like saying city council meeting, city hall, Congress, parliament. It was the place where legislation was made at the gates. So it's a legal term because hell does not defeat you with power. Hell defeats you with legality. Hell operates on a legislature, okay? It operates legally. And if you do not understand that, it's not just power operating, it's power operating from an illegal position, but yet from a legal posture. So he says the gates of hell shall not overpower it. Now he's talking about the church. Then he goes further. Now we come to, come to verse 19. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, kingdom is God's rule. And I'm going to give you keys. He says, I'm going to give you access to me to legislate from there back down to where you live. And I'm going to give you these keys. Now, the reason why there are multiple keys is because there are multiple gates. Well, now we come to the end of verse 19. Whatsoever you bound on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been already loosed in heaven. I got you. So what exactly are we binding and loosing? Well, let me tell you. Based on this passage, you're binding and loosing what's coming out of hell gates of hell, you're binding and loosing. So what's the difference between binding and loosing? Bind, when, you, when you've been binding something, you're tying it up. You're keeping it from mobility. You're keeping it from moving. To bind means something is coming after you that you want held back from you. You want it to be tied up. You don't want it to get through. You don't want it to to be able to penetrate you. It's holding evil, Satan, hell off of you. Loosing is because he already got you. He's already all up in your grill. He's already controlling something. You're already addicted. You're already living in defeat. You're already relationally in discord. You're already miserable and you can't get out of it and you need to be loosed from the hostage taking he's already taken you. Binding is keeping him off you or anything that is influenced by him because 
the hell influences everything. It influences debt. It influences bad relationships. It influences addictions. It influences uh, hell. Hell can influence any area of your life. To bind it means to keep it from having a illegitimate dominant influence. To loose means it's already having an illegitimate dominant influence. I'm already in debt over my head and can't get out. I'm already in a bad situation relationship. I'm already addicted to something or the other. And I'm already held hostage and nothing is working, but I need to be loosed. I studied the Bible in college for four years. I studied the Bible for four years working on my master's degree, another four years working on my doctoral degree. And then I've been preaching all of these years and I'm still learning new things from this awesome, inexhaustible book, The Word of God. And that's why I'm so excited about the Tony Evans Study Bible and its accompanying work, the Tony Evans Bible Commentary. It will take all of this training and this teaching and make it available to you to understand, utilize, and apply God's most powerful word. I need to be set free from it. He says to be, to bind, to keep it off you because it's coming at you, or the loose, because it's already got you and you want to get rid of it. He says, you must do it. Whatever you bind, I got you. Whatever you loose, I got you. Heaven will back you up. Well, if the problem is the gates of hell, he says, you must use the keys of heaven and you must do it in concert with the church because that's the entity that owns the keys. So you don't have a private key ring. You, you don't have your own keys. The church has the keys. You have to use those keys for your situation. So now that we have that framework, let's go back to chapter 18. He starts off again in, in verse 18 and he begins this process by talking about binding and loosing. But now he goes further and he's going to explain how to get this thing working for you. So I'm assuming somebody in here needs to bind something or loose something. Again, I say to you, verse 19, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Oh. Now we get down to two or three. Interesting. Two or three witnesses is not a novel concept. It's all through the Bible. American civil government to a large degree borrowed from the Bible and one of the things they borrowed was the principle of witnesses. In Deuteronomy 19 verse 15, it says you cannot accuse somebody by the witness of one person, there must be two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse six, you cannot bring an accusation or judgment by one person, there must be two or three witnesses. So two or three witnesses was used of uh, confirming something legally because it's used of trying civil cases. Jesus takes the principle of legality, two and three witnesses, and applies it now to binding and loosing. Why? Because we are seeking to do in the spiritual realm what the political realm was seeking to do in civil judgments. To do that, he says you need two or three witnesses. Now, this is not just two or three people out of nowhere because in verse 17 he says, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So he hasn't left the church. 
He's still talking about the church because that is the authorized legal entity from heaven to history. So let me explain something. When you connect with people, even if they're Christians, who are not connected to the embassy, they can't help you with binding and loosing. Because binding and loosing has only been delegated to the church, not just to you out here just binding stuff and I bind the devil and you're about, you know, no, no, no. If you are disconnected from the embassy, that's why people don't just need to go to church for preaching. People don't need to go to church just for singing. He says two or three gathered. Okay, the word gathered is used of the church in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Don't forsake the gathering. It's, it's talking about the church. He says, when they are connected and two or three, now we got legal validity because that's how the word two or three is used in scripture. We've got legal authorization. So let's see how you can begin to bind and loose. Keep, keep the devil off of you in whatever category he's on you or get him off of you if he's already locked you down and loose him and get, get, get him off of your back. No longer is he controlling whatever area of your life that he happens to be controlling right now. He says, if you come together, two or three, that's a legal gathering because it's connected to the church, anything, somebody say anything. That's like whatever. Okay, verse 18 says whatever, verse 19 says anything. Anything that they may ask. Oh, we just introduced prayer, ask. So now you are asking, you're asking heaven to intervene on your behalf in history for the binding and loosing as defined in chapter 16, which is the gates of hell. He says, ask anything that they may ask Please notice something. The two must agree. Forget spiritual authority where there is disunity. So he says it must be by agreement. That is, you've got to be in the same, you're different people, but you've got to be on the same spiritual page. Okay? So he says that. And then he makes a staggering promise. It shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. So you must bind, you must bring God's perspective, the keys, you must talk to God, the prayer, you must be in agreement with God, and then you must be linked to the legal entity, the local church. And he says, and you've done it in my name. In my name. He said, the Father's going to do it, but you got to do it in my name. Now, Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Translation, I'm in charge now. I'm in charge up there in heaven and I'm in charge down here on earth and I'm the link between the two. So in order to get it from heaven down here to earth, Jesus is saying, you gotta come through me. There's one mediator between God and man and the Bible says that is the man, Christ Jesus. He will only give his authority when you're operating on his authority based on his keys connected with his institution done by agreement. And he says that you must do it in my name, but he says something else. And there am I in the midst. Whoa. See, a lot of us pray in Jesus' name while he is on the periphery. He cannot be on the periphery. He must be in the, he must be the centerpiece of the decision. You want to know God's philosophy of history? It's Ephesians 1.10. Because Ephesians 1.10 says God has circulated all of history around the centrality of Jesus Christ. So, binding and loosing, getting the devil from tying you up or releasing you if you've been tied up, is tied to authority. Authority is tied to Christ. Christ is tied to his church. Binding and loosing is tied to that connectivity by agreement. And then there is the provision of divine authority where the Father responds when we do it in his name. See, a lot of us use Jesus' name and we'll even quote Jesus' word but without authorization 
because we're not subjected to Jesus' will or subjected to Jesus' authority or subjected to Jesus' okay. And so it becomes an unauthorized use. And when it is an unauthorized use, you can't bind and loose, which means you can't have authority. Okay? But you must do the binding and loosing. God's not going to do it for you. He's going to say, I got you when you're operating as he said. So the question now is, why the two or three in this context? Let me use a biblical illustration that, to try to make sense of this. In Exodus chapter 17, beginning around verse 8, Israel is in a battle. They're in a war. They're fighting. It's a life and death struggle. They're battling. Moses goes up to the top of the hill. And Moses takes the rod, the staff that God gave him. They turned it into the rod of God. And Moses held it up. The rod was Moses' symbol of authority. He opened the Red Sea with the rod. It was a symbol of heaven coming down to change something on earth when he held up the rod. As long as Moses held up the rod, it says, Israel prevailed. But the moment Moses dropped the rod, it says the enemy prevailed. Oh, wait a minute now. Israel down in the valley, doing the best they can, fighting as hard as they can, trying as hard as they can. But whether they were winning or losing wasn't determined by how hard they were trying. It was determined by what Moses was doing, upholding up, the symbol of authority. A lot of us are trying hard to fix our mess, get out of debt, get out of addiction, solve this problem, heal this mess. It's not we trying, we're trying down here in this battle, but the problem is something's gotta be solved up there to give you victory down here. The problem occurred, however, that it says Moses' arms got heavy. In other words, he got tired. Let me put it another way. He got sick and tired. He got tired. His arms got heavy and his arms started to droop. And when his arms started to droop, it says the enemy began to prevail because the symbol of authority had been lost. So Moses got two other men to come and to hold up his arms because he was tired. And he was going to droop and quit and give up. But the two men held up his arms. They became two witnesses. And when they held up his arms, it says, and Israel prevailed over their enemies. Let me put it another way. What was happening on the ground would not ultimately be determined by what they were doing on the ground. Now, they still had to fight on the ground, but the power and the authority for the victory of the fight was not on the ground where they were fighting. The authority and victory and power would come from what was happening in the invisible realm that would determine whether they won or lost in the visible realm. If you're fighting for your marriage, if you're fighting for successful singlehood, if you're fighting for the debt, if you're fighting for the addiction, or whatever the situation happens to be, yes, you have a responsibility to do what you ought to do, but that's not where the authority lies. Whatever you bind, whatever you lose, it says, I will have already done it in heaven. So the answer is up there. So to put it another way, if you ignore the spiritual, if you ignore the keys, if you ignore the connection with the church, if you ignore the agreement, if you ignore those things, you will not get help from heaven while you're battling the warfare on earth. You will only get victory on earth because you have engaged the authority of heaven God's way. And when you and I do that, now we'll see some binding and loop. In New York City, in the harbor 
of New York City stands a lady inscribed on Lady Liberty as you so well know are these words. Give me your tired and your poor. Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. On Lady Liberty's crown are seven spikes reflecting seven seas and seven continents where the invitation stands open to all to come to freedom. At the base of Lady Liberty is a chain that has been broken. She stands there in the harbor of New York to represent what this nation was to be founded upon and the nature of how it operates. She's called Lady, Lady Liberty because she stands for freedom. Freedom is not something that belongs to a country or nation. Freedom is something that God offered in the Garden of Eden. From every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Paul has made it clear in one of our previous discussions that it was for freedom Christ has set you free. He set you free to be free. He didn't set you free to stay in bondage. And yet, many of us today find ourselves bound. Personal bondages, known as addictions, the biblical phrase for it, strongholds, things that are holding us hostage and keeping us from being what we know God wants us to be. I'm not talking about the person who doesn't care now. I'm not talking about the person who's in rebellion. I'm talking about the person who really wants to be free. They want to leave where they are and get to where they're supposed to go. And you're looking for freedom. There are relational bondages where people are bound to people that they shouldn't be bound to or known as codependency or people wanting to know do I have to stay in this relationship am I stuck here am I bound to this unhappy situation I find myself in and they are longing to be free there are circumstantial bondages that people find themselves in whether it's economic and they're bound by the reality of not having enough or barely having enough to make ends meet. Or maybe there are physical realities where they're bound to feeling bad because of circumstances happening within their bodies and they long to be free from the disease. Freedom or the desire for freedom comes in all shapes and all sizes. We have explained freedom does not mean no restrictions. Freedom means being released from illegitimate restrictions. You're not free to live in water because you weren't created for that. So you're bound by air and land. So, so freedom doesn't mean the absence of restrictions, it just means the removal of illegitimate restrictions. God in the garden gave a restriction from every 
tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree in the midst of the garden you may not. That is off limits. That is a legitimate restriction. So the issue in freedom is not whether there's restriction versus no restriction. When you watch the football game, there will be restrictions. There will be boundaries so that the game can be free to be played. No boundaries, there's chaos in the stadium. It is the removal of illegitimate boundaries. So the question to discuss freedom is, is this boundary legitimate or illegitimate? And one of the things that you will always know about freedom, and that is that boundaries will always enhance it, never destroy it, if it's a legitimate boundary. Having said all we've said, and we've talked about freedom up, down, in and out, how do we conclude? Jesus Christ has now gone public. He is now asserting who he is as the Son of God and the Son of Man, all God, all man, and one person. The most unique person who has ever entered history. There is nobody like Jesus Christ. He is not one among many. You can't say Muhammad and Jesus as though they are uh, equals or Buddha and Jesus or Confucius and Jesus or you and Jesus. He is to be compared with no one because there's no other name other than the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. He is in a class by himself. He is fully God, but he's also fully man. As a man, his job was to represent God in history. And so he got hungry because he was a man. He said, I thirst because he was a man. He had to sleep because he was a man. But he could walk on water because he was God. He could raise the dead because he was God. He could, so so he, 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 could, he could move in his humanity based on his relationship to deity. He comes to the synagogue in the neighborhood where he grew up, Nazareth. And they hand him the book of Isaiah and he turns the pages and comes to Isaiah chapter 61 and then he quotes it or reads it. He says in verse 18 of Luke 4 as he's reading Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is on me and he has anointed me to preach good news the gospel the word gospel means good news when we talk about the gospel we're talking about good news that's what it means the huon gelion that is the good message good news and it was good news about freedom he says I have good news for poor people he says, I've got good news to captives. I've got good news to the blind. And I've got good news to the oppressed. All of them need to be freed from something. The poor from poverty. The captives from their captivity. The blind from sightlessness. The, oppre the oppressed from their slavery. He says, I have come to declare good news and the Spirit of God is upon me and has anointed me. When he says that he has been anointed, it means he has been duly dubbed. He has been identified and recognized by God through the Holy Spirit to proclaim good news. Jesus Christ has good news to you and me today about freedom. 
And he has, he's the authorized representative of God as a man to tell other men and women the good news of freedom. In the Old Testament, to be anointed meant to be dubbed. David was anointed as king. That means he was one recognized as having been identified with God, by God, as the new leader for Israel or as the next priest. He has been selected, if you will. Jesus Christ has been uniquely selected to proclaim to people good news about freedom. And the Spirit is backing him up. The Spirit of God is upon me. In other words, this is a supernatural offer. This isn't folk talking to other folk about freedom. This is a supernatural offer. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, has come here today based on his word to make a supernatural offer because he's been authorized to do so. I made a phone call for uh, an, a repair I needed at my home and I called and I was trying to get it worked out where the person uh, would work out the repair and I needed some other things done and her statement was, sir, I'm going to have to get my supervisor because I'm not authorized to do that. I haven't been anointed. In other words, uh, there has been no recognition that I can give you what you're asking for. Now, I sincerely ask her. She sincerely wanted to help, but she didn't have the anointing. She, she, she was not duly dubbed and recognized as having the capacity to give me what I needed to fix what was broke in my house. She called her supervisor to the phone. Her supervisor, a gentleman, came to the phone and I explained to him the situation that I was having to get rectified and he said, I, I am not authorized to do what you're asking me to do. I, 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 I somewhat evangelically ticked off, said, because you know, them phone calls can last a long time and, 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 and so I, I, I said, well, can you get me somebody who has the authority, the authorization, the power to respond to my need. I got something broke. I need something fixed. But everybody I'm talking to, they want to help me, but they can't help me because they haven't been authorized. I need somebody with some power, some clout, who has been anointed to be able to speak. I, I don't need somebody that's got to go to somebody else, has got to go to somebody else, got to go to somebody else, got to go to somebody else. I want to get to the right person who has been duly authorized to fix my broke down situation. Finally, I got somebody on the line who had been anointed, who had the power to take care of what a lot of other folks wanted to help me with, but were incapable of solving. See, a lot of us been seeking freedom in all the wrong places. We've been going to scenarios that maybe want to help, would like to help, but they've not been anointed. They are not duly authorized to be able to set you free. But Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. And I have been duly authorized. I have been anointed in order to set the captives free or to proclaim good news. So, so I'm closing this series today with some gospel. That means good news. Some good news that freedom is staring you right in the face. And I... I don't know what you need to be free from, but whatever it is, I know somebody who's duly authorized to offer it. 
Jesus opens the Bible and says, I've been duly authorized. Some of you, some of us have been trying to be free from something for years. You name it. And there's somebody in here that has it. It may be pornography. It may be gambling. It may be drugs. It may be alcohol. It may be cigarettes. It may be a cursing tongue. It may be an illegitimate relationship. It may be whatever it is. You've been trying for years. You, you've been like a hamster. You ever seen a hamster on a wheel? It's trying to go somewhere. That, that hamster is trying to go somewhere. Sometimes it goes slow and sometimes it goes fast. It's trying, but all it is is going in circles. It's going in circles because it's been boxed in a cage. You know what that hamster needs? It needs somebody to reach in there and pick it up out of its situation. Because no matter how hard it tries and how fast it goes, it will never be any further when it finishes than when it started. Why? Because it's boxed in to an enslaved situation. But if somebody that's not locked in can reach in and lift it out, it can deliver it from its wheel kind of life. And somebody has been churning on a wheel and you tired of running in the same spot. But I know somebody who's been duly authorized and anointed with supernatural power to set captives free. There's some here today and people that you know who feel like it's hopeless. This is my lot in life and I'm just going to muddle through try to make it, get by the best that I can, and you've given up on ever thinking about being free. In other words, you've gotten used to slavery. You've gotten used to whatever mental, emotional, physical incarceration you're going through. This has become your lot in life. This is just the way it is. You know... How many have gone to Disneyland or Disney World? You've been to either one of those two, okay? Most of you. You know, after about two or three hours in Disneyland and Disney World, you begin to think that all that stuff has been sized correctly. Now, in other words, these are miniature buildings. When you walk in there, these are miniature buildings. But if you're there long enough, it looks normal. Because that's all you're surrounded with. So it looks like this is the way it's supposed to be. Till you come back out. And you're faced with the real deal about the real size of things. In other words, you can be duped into thinking this is how things are supposed to be. Because you've been hanging there for two, three, four, five, or all day. You've been hanging out there, so this is the way it's supposed to be. When that's not the real world, you've been duped to think that's the real world because you've been hanging there too long. Jesus Christ says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to proclaim good news. The gospel is good news. It is good news about eternity because when you trust Jesus Christ, that means you're on your way to heaven. When you go to the cross for the forgiveness of sins, you're on your way to heaven. That's good news. It's good news to know the thing you fear most will never happen. Death. Most people, if, if they gave their greatest fear, would be to die. The good news of the gospel is you will never die. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As soon as you die, you won't be dead long enough to know you died. Because you are immediately ushered into the presence of the Lord. So the thing you fear most, or most people fear most, is the thing that will never ever happen. Because immediately you usher into the presence of the Lord if you've come to Jesus Christ for salvation. 
But the good news is bigger than heaven. Uh, uh, bigger is not the better word because heaven is eternal, eternal. But it is more than heaven. The good news includes earth. Please notice the passage. He says, I've come to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, if you're poor, what's good news? That something is going to address your poverty. That something is going to change your status in life. If you're poor, that means something better is coming along. That's, that's good news. If, 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 you, if you're poor and you hear next week you're going to be poorer, that's bad news. If you're in captivity, good news is that you are going to be released, that somebody has posted bail. If you're in jail and somebody posts bail, that's good news, that you're going to be released from your captivity. If you're blind and now you know you're going to get to see, that's good news. If you're oppressed, somebody's got their foot on your neck, on your back, and you've discovered now that you're going to be released from that oppressive situation. That's good news. But this is not just about heaven because you aren't poor in heaven. You aren't oppressed in heaven. You aren't blind in heaven. These are earth's issues. Now when people write about this passage, you'll see two extremes. There will be the spiritual interpretation that none of this is physical, it's spiritual poverty, it's spiritual captivity, it's all spiritual. So it doesn't relate to people's social condition, it doesn't relate to people's to slavery in America or in South Africa, it doesn't relate to that, it's all spiritual. Then you've got the liberation theology that makes it all social. Come to Jesus and he'll change the uh, economics of the day and he'll change the social structures of the day and he'll change the political environments of the day. And to pick either extreme is to miss the point. Jesus starts off with, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. So he starts off spiritual, but his spiritual perspective goes to a practical reality. I am glad that Jesus Christ and my relationship with him is going to take me to heaven. I'm glad about that. But I'm also glad that my relationship with him can affect circumstances in history. To affect circumstances in history and I miss out on eternity, well, that's not good. If a man, if a man doesn't have a place to stay, that's bad, but he can recover from that. If a person doesn't have the best food to eat, that's bad, but he can recover from that. If a person doesn't have the nicest clothes, that's bad, but he can recover from that. If a person doesn't have a great job and are living, is living on minimum wage, that's bad, but he can recover from that. But if a man or woman dies without a relationship with Jesus Christ, you just hit him with a blow he can never recover from. So merely to say that this is a social uh, uh, reality is not good enough. On the other hand, to tell me that Jesus can get me to heaven, but he's not much benefit to me on my way there. To tell me that I got a home in heaven, but he can't give me a home on earth. To tell me that, uh, you know, up in heaven, I got shoes, you got shoes, all God children got shoes, but I got to go bare feet on earth. To tell me I've got a white robe up there, but I can't get a coat down here would seem to suggest that Jesus Christ is so otherworld-minded that he can't practically meet me where I am today. To understand how all this fits together, you have to understand the last phrase in verse 19. He says, I've come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus said, I have come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. 
Now, to what does that refer? Every Jew there understood what Jesus was talking about. Look at verse 20. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Okay, wait a minute. He just, all he did was read the scripture. How are you going to be paralyzed? That's fixed on him. Bug-eyed on him. How are you going to be fixed on him? All he did was read the Bible. Because he understood when he quoted Isaiah 61, they understood the implications because the Jews were captive under Rome when he read this. They were looking for Messiah who would deliver them. In fact, the Jews in Israel today are still looking for Messiah because they rejected Jesus. So they're looking for somebody to deliver them in their Middle Eastern dilemma. I've been over to Israel six times and, and every time I've gone or taken a group over there, the guide would always say, we're waiting for Messiah. Because when Messiah comes, he's going to bring peace to the Middle East and he's going to change this situation. We are waiting. Because they understood back then and they understand today that it would be Messiah, which means the anointed one who would bring deliverance to our historical dilemma. What they're waiting for is the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, what that refers to is Leviticus chapter 25. It was called the year of Jubilee. Let me just tell you a little something, something about the year of Jubilee. Because what Jesus is offering them, and guess what, what he's offering you, is Jubilee. In Leviticus chapter 25, here's what Jesus says. Or here's what God says, beginning with verse 8. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years, seven times seven. You then shall sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. You shall sound a horn all through the land. You shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim a release. Remember, release to the captives. A release through the land to all the inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his own property. Each of you shall return to his family. You shall have the 50th year as a jubilee. You shall not sow nor reap its aftergrowth nor gather in from its untrimmed vines for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy for you. You shall eat its crops of the field. On this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his own property. Property. If you make a sale moreover, your friend or buy from your friend's hand, you shall not wrong one another corresponding to the number of years of jubilee verse 17 so you shall not wrong one another but you shall fear God for I am the Lord your God let me tell you about the year of jubilee or the acceptable year of the Lord the Lord's year okay this is the Lord's year he says every 49 years you are to proclaim the year of jubilee because over this period of time, society will be set back. That you're going to get in debt. Uh, you're going to lose property. Some people will have sold themselves into slavery. He will go into that later on in that chapter about the setting the slaves free. He says things are going to get out of whack. So every 49th year, I want you to introduce the year of Jubilee where I'm going to put stuff right again that y'all have messed up. Every 49th year, I'm going to change your jacked up situation by declaring a year of liberation, a year of Jubilee. Let me tell you a little bit about the year of Jubilee. In the year of Jubilee, all debts were canceled. Wouldn't somebody like a year of Jubilee? 
in the year of Jubilee, whatever bills were owed were now canceled and you started all over again. In the year of Jubilee, all slaves had to be set free and released. Property was returned to its original owner because this was the Lord's Jubilee. It was a celebration that released from debt, released from slavery, released from uh, uh, illegitimacy, and God was now putting things right again, setting people free. Jesus said, I have come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say God wants to offer you Jubilee. And that's good news. The acceptable year of the Lord. The year that the Lord wants to come and make stuff right for you again. Some of us are in debts that we shouldn't be in. And God says, I got good news. I've got good news for you who are in impressive situations. I've got good news. I've got good news for you who are, who are, 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 are in addictions. I've got good news. My good news is the acceptable year of the Lord. But I hear what you're saying. You're saying, but pastor, I can't wait 49 years. I can't wait seven times seven. Read verse 21. He said to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he told his audience, You don't have to wait any longer. You don't have to wait and hope next year is better. You don't have to wait to January 1 to make New Year's resolutions. God says, Today, right here, right now is your jubilee. So these folk are staring at him like he crazy, like some of you are staring at me like I'm crazy. He's so crazy. You mean I've been dealing with this thing all these years and you talking about today? You talking about right, 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 right now? He says, today, Now, let me give you the bad news before I close again with the good news. The bad news is that they didn't get free. That's the bad news. The bad news is that they didn't get delivered. The bad news is that that situation didn't change. Well, how can he say today and nothing got better for the Jewish people and they're still not better? Because he said, I have come to proclaim good news. Underline proclaim. I'm going to give you the good news. But you must accept the good news for the good news that I tell you about to become good news for you. In other words, you can hear good news and amen good news praise the Lord good news hallelujah good news and in God great good news and not experience the good news for you you see back in Leviticus chapter 25 verse 9 when God says this shall be a jubilee with you it was inaugurated with the day of atonement in other words you didn't get the social until you got the spiritual. Okay, is everybody with me? The day of atonement was when you got right with God. He says, when you get right with me, day of atonement, debts will be canceled. Slaves will be released. Families will be put back together again, he says in the passage. If you skip the day of atonement, in order to get the social benefits of Jubilee, you don't get the spiritual and you lose out on the social. See, a lot of people who want God to do stuff in history don't want a, the Day of Atonement. They want to skip 
the spiritual and get right to God pay my bills. Get right to God get me out of this addiction. Get right to God fix my family. Get right to God make this better when they have skipped the thing that inaugurates the day. If the spiritual is not foundational, if the spiritual is not the first thing, if the spiritual is not priority, if the spiritual gets thrown by the wayside, if all that matters to you when you come to church is to hear the sermon, you're not going to get jubilee. In fact, the most important thing that happens in our church is not the sermon, it's communion because that's atonement. Because it is there at the cross that I reestablish my relationship with Christ, where I'm forgiven for my sins for sanctification, where I recommit myself to follow under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That happens at the cross. That doesn't happen in the sermon. But people want the sermon without the cross and wonder why they're not free. The day of atonement had to precede the experience of freedom. Today, I deliver this message in your hearing. I am the anointed one. That is, I have the power to grant release based on your response to me. The reason why the Jews didn't get free was they rejected him, but they wanted freedom. You cannot sideline Jesus and get victory. You can't sideline Jesus and get freedom. You can't sideline Jesus and be released. You can't be a secret agent Christian and be released. That comes with the full recognition of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ doesn't have say so in your life, Lordship, rule, control, if the relationship spiritually is not the priority, then don't expect to get the release that he's talking about. And the release that he's talking about, he's offering it today. Today. The anointing. Yeah, let me, let me say this. The anointing is closer than you think. Because if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, Christ is in you. You got people running around here saying, I wish I was anointed. Well, 1 John 2.20 says, you are. It says, if you're a Christian, you have the anointing. The anointed one has already anointed you. Because the anointed one, if you are a Christian, is living inside of you. You, you have the anointing. You looking for something you already have. I was looking for my keys. You know how frustrating it is when you can't find your keys? You're in a hurry. You got to go somewhere. You got an appointment. And you, first of all, you're frantic. So you go, you're just looking everywhere. You're looking everywhere. You're looking everywhere. And, and you're just, just bouncing around. Then you say, okay, this is not working. Let me structure my search. And so now you structure it and you go from room to room, from spot to spot, uh, you know, and you're trying to find it. Okay, okay. The structure doesn't work. So now you're looking in, in places where you would maybe it fell between the pillars and the couch. And, you know, so now you're looking and, and, and it's, it's, it's so frustrating. I couldn't find my keys. I'm late. I'm going nowhere because I can't find my car keys. In the midst of my frustration, I throw up my hands and hit my side. I pull the keys out of my pocket. Because I'm searching for something I already have. I'm searching for something I already have. I'm searching for something I already possess. You already have the check. Cash it. Jesus Christ is already set up to set you free. He's already proclaiming freedom to the captives. But the day of atonement, that is your relationship spiritually, 
will determine your freedom in all the dimensions of your life. If the spiritual is out of whack, don't expect the social to get ordered. Harry Houdini, you know him, the famous escape artist. He bragged that he could escape from anywhere, anywhere. And they said, well, we have a cell you can't escape out of, Houdini. He said, bring it on. They took him to this cell, and he had this metal object he would always use to pick locks and to break out. He took out the object, and he began to work it, and work it, and work it. But it wasn't working this time. It wasn't working this time. He took off his shirt and began to work it and work it. It wasn't working. He took off his t-shirt because he's sweating. He's now four hours into this thing and the great Houdini is stuck. It's not that he's not trying. It's not that he's not sweating and making a resolution, I'm going to break out of here. It just wasn't working. He threw down his metal thing and just fell against the door and it flew open. He was trying to unlock something that was already unlocked. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. On the cross, Jesus unlocked the cell and you fighting to get what you already have. And that is freedom. I feel raindrops on my head I feel calm when I stand there Wanna be like all these people But my mind's gone deeper And I'm a fan now I walk around And every time try to find And I'm a fan now See the body by my side and I'm feeling fine Every time try to find And I'm a 